Hello mudlarking friends and happy new year. In this video you'll see a roundup of my favourite finds from 2022. So sit back, relax and enjoy our findings on the foreshore. It's an enormous strap handle piece, fragment. I'm not sure you can really see it. So what I'll do, I'll clean that up and then put the info on the screen now. This large piece of medieval greyware is zooming up the charts to be my favorite ever piece of pottery. I love it. Dating from circa 1190 to 1270, it's possibly a Hertfordshire product. Get your head round that. 1190 to 1270. What madness is this? I've just recovered a piece of 800 year old pottery from the River Thames foreshore. What I love about this, apart from its age, is patently obvious. Check out the chunky, carefully constructed rope type of decoration, this braided part here, on the jug handle. Now the handle itself is in the strap style, and you can see here in the recess that the rope decoration is sitting in. It was also stabbed in various places. These little holes here are known as stabs, and you often find stabs and slashes in jug handles and as jug decoration. The raised edges of the handle, and again this is more thoughtfully considered decoration, I absolutely love this piece. It's just smashing. Fabric-wise, it feels almost like dried lava. It's a very strange fabric, and I had to double-check with the pottery legend, Richard Hemery, to confirm what this fabric actually is. It feels something between stoneware and earthenware, and like I said, it feels like dried lava. A very strange-feeling fabric. Now, if you take a look at the inside of this piece, so this would be the inside here, you can see clear finger marks. Now this is where the potter has put their hands into the opening of the jug and smoothed down the inside walls like this. Check this out. So they've made this motion and you can see that it's left behind on the fabric. It's crazy. As I said, hands down, this is my favorite piece of pottery that I have ever found. Lurking behind here. Here we go. There she is. Boom. Modern, but who cares? That is so cool. I love it. Love religious iconography. I say modern, but. That's got a bit of wear going on, hasn't it? I can barely see and my spectacles are really steamed up. Is there a date on there? Well, if there is, and you can see it and I can't because my spectacles are so steamed up. Mmm, okay. This is my last find of the day, I think. I mean, <laughs> I'm heading back slowly. Oh, I'm in love with it, brilliant. And it's double-sided. Wow, perfect. There we go, it's popped up a quarter of a hammy. Oh goodness, can you even see this there? That is a coin, a hammered coin that has been quartered. And we should be able to work out what that is once I'm home. 
Um, it's got some quite good detail on it. And here comes another huge boat, so I'm just going to jump out the way, but I'm glad I saved that just in time. Oh god, what's this? A little bit of chain. Oh god, some other stuff. I don't want to drop the hammy. Okay, I'm going to jump out the way and then come back to this spot. Please don't let me have dropped this little hammer quarter. Hang on. Uh, and let's watch the old tide wash up. Sorry, it's all a bit wobbly and bumpy. This surface is really wobbly. Okay, there's the big boat. Have I got the hammy still? Yes. Oh, and look at that, a little bit of... Oh, that's really pretty. I don't know what it is. Could be a bit of pilgrim badge. And then we've got this little chain here. Right, I'm getting back down in that spot. The tiniest little finds, but beautiful. Well, it would appear the old Uber boat did me a favor because just here, there it is. There's a nice, and I think it might be a medieval token. There we are. Lovely stuff. I can't actually make it out too well, but looks to me like a medieval token. I shall soon be correcting myself on the screen there if I'm wrong. Oh yeah, nice one. Whopper. Look at that beauty. Now that is a solid pin and you can see clearly here where the pin head, a separate piece of wire, has been wound round onto the top of the body of the pin. That is such a cool thing. Considering people made these by hand, pinners made these, Often children and women worked on the heads there. And you can find these up until about 1900. Um, and then obviously pins during the Industrial Revolution uh, became an industry in themselves. But that is smashing. Sometimes you find them with decorative heads as well. Now I think this one's quite an early one. Generally people say they're Tudor pins, they're not all Tudor pins, you know, they, they span such a large time frame. But that whopper is such a thing of beauty and it gives me real joy actually to find these. There we are. Cloth seal. I'm really pleased with that find. There's a Tudor rose on it there. Doesn't necessarily mean it's Tudor. Um, and you can see there's the joining strip. So there we are, cloth seal of some kind. And I am really pleased with that. Is a strange thing for last knockings. Made from pipe clay, but very slim. How strange. That's a nice little find for last knockings, as it's called. There we go. And my first ever wig curler. Believe it or not, five years, six years now almost. 
and I haven't found one of these before. And there we go, we've broken the back of my wig curler drought. Down here has caught my eye, and in all honesty, I don't know what it is, but I've got a good feeling about it. Here it is. It looks like a little dish, doesn't it? Complete, but for this here. Now that, I will double check with Richard. I'm not saying anything just yet, but I'm hoping that that is something pretty cool. I said I had a hunch about this little ceramic find, but first I wanted to check in with the go-to pottery guy, Richard Hemery. I deduced that this object was once used as a dish or shallow bowl in the grinding or melting of something, but what exactly? Cupellation. Ever heard of it? Cupellation is a refining process, a way of separating noble metals from base metals. This little ceramic find is, in fact, a post-medieval cupel, a vessel much like a crucible, but smaller and shallower, used in the smelting and separating of metals. Its definition in the Oxford English Dictionary, a shallow, porous container in which gold or silver can be refined or assayed. So, this little dish, a cupel, was used in the process of cupellation, as well as assaying, to determine the content or quality of a metal ore, or think jewellery making, and of course, the magical, mysterious world of alchemy. Cupels are porous and were often made of bone ash, which absorbed unwanted oxides. Now this ceramic cupel here has been made with some kind of redware. Richard told me to take a close look at the inside of the dish, as sometimes noble or base metals are left behind after firing. I can't see anything obvious here, but looking through my loop, there are some traces of a silvery substance, just little flecks. Now, could that be silver? Whatever it is, I'm so pleased with this little slice of alchemical history. I don't know if you can guess why I've stopped here. I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's this thing. And the second question is, I don't know if you can guess what it is. You know I've got a bit of a thing for these. If I'm right, this is a huge piece of kiln furniture or kiln waste product or it's just some leftover explosion from the kiln. It's salt glaze and it would have been used in the firing of salt glaze pottery. There's another piece I can see over here. Here it is. There's a telltale sign on this and it's that little base of an aperture there. I think that would have been a triangle that way maybe but I think more than likely I will double check with the legend Richard Henry that this was part of a saga. I'm gonna work on getting this out so we can have a look at it but that so far is my find of the day believe it or not because it looks pretty ugly and rotten but it's a special thing. Now obviously if this is way too deep for me to dig out because we're only permitted to dig to certain depth then I will leave it here but that's a very cool thing this is where I've got to so far I'm gonna give it a little bit more of a dig okay there's the hole so you know I've got it out And you're gonna think I'm crazy for this, but once it's cleaned up, you will maybe see why I'm taking it home. That is a brilliant piece of history.
<laughs> Off I went once again to consult the pottery maestro Richard Hemery. Honestly, I've never known anyone other than myself to be this excited about kiln supports, kiln furniture, and even kiln waste as Richard Hemery. Richard agreed with me that this enormous piece of stoneware is indeed some kind of kiln support for some kind of very large salt glazed vessels. Looking carefully at the object, Richard could see clearly that curves are visible on two of its edges and in fact you can see that it might even be a profile of whatever vessel was being fired, perhaps one or two stacked around the kiln support. Richard commented that manufacturers like Dalton were making huge six gallon vessels for industrial purposes and that kind of vessel would fit well with the kind of shapes you can see here on my salt glazed kiln support. Now I wondered if this large stoneware lump had drifted east, reaching this part of the foreshore directly from the Lambeth area, once home to large industrial potteries such as James Stiff and Son and Dalton. Before locating to the potteries in the 1950s, the embankment in the Lambeth area was home to a thriving pottery industry. In 1840, located over a two-acre site, James Stiff and Son was one of the largest potteries in London. It employed 200 people, had 14 kilns, and even required its own riverside dock. Another world-famous pottery, Dalton, started life in London, with John Dalton once apprenticed to John Dwight's Fulham pottery. That's them of the salt-glazed pottery over in Fulham. We've touched on this place before. Now, once Dalton completed his apprenticeship with Dwight, he joined a small pottery in Vauxhall Walk, Lambeth, and he specialised in salt-glazed stoneware, making bottles, jugs and jars, and later this company expanded their business to making glazed sewer pipes. Dalton & Co acquired a large pottery on the High Street in 1826. As demands for glazed pipes rose dramatically in the 1830s to 40s, they were now employing 12 staff working across two kilns at 28 Lambeth High Street. In the 1870s, Dalton & Co, now incredibly successful, built a new pottery complex. And by 1889, the company employed around 2,000 people in Lambeth. At the turn of the century, the company were awarded the royal warrant by King Edward VII, becoming Royal Dalton, as you probably have heard of them now. With all this success and historical importance, surely the site remains today? Well, no, thanks to World War II, it doesn't. The Dalton factory with its prominent chimney and riverside location was an easy target for the Nazis in the Second World War. Lambeth sustained heavy bombing, causing irreparable damage to the Dalton complex and the surrounding area. In 1952, the factory's A and B blocks were demolished along with the chimney. This coincided with the British government bringing in clean air regulations in the 1950s, which meant closing the factory for good. And this is the point that Dalton & Co moved production to the potteries in Staffordshire. So, is this ugly to some, but lovable to me? Chunk of salt glazed stoneware, a direct link to the old potteries of Lambeth? Well, I don't know for sure, but I am willing to put a large wager on it. And that's why it's come home with me. What do I see down here? I'm going to give you a moment to spot it. It's kind of an obvious one. And here it is. Now, you can hear the tide lapping at my feet, so I'm going to jump out the way. Here we go. This piece of pottery here is a chunky piece of London type ware, 12th to 14th century. London type wear is often decorated with white slip and that gave the impression of a whiter fabric. It's a rod handle and it's so thick I'm surprised it doesn't have any slash or stab marks on it which potters applied to avoid fractures during firing. It's a great piece of medieval pottery and I'm super pleased with it. That is what looks like some slip that's been put on there and the pot has left an impression in it. 
Wow, I love that. That's a definite keeper. Wow, look at that. What a beauty. So that is stoneware. And I'm not actually too sure which way up that goes. <laughs> I think it might be the base. Love that piece of pottery, especially the manipulation of clay here, where the potter has used their hands to make all this decoration. Right, I just grabbed this up because there's an Uber boat charging its way down here. It's a button day, I tell thee. Here's another. And it actually has got a name on it, so we can do some lovely research on that. It looks like H. Culpin or Gulpin. Exciting stuff. Henry James Culpin, Master Tailor from Warrington, Northamptonshire. Born July 1847, died March 1909. Henry married relatively late in life, at 33, having moved around in the years between 1861 and 1881. He eventually settled and lived at and worked from premises at 27 Cowgate, Peterborough, with his wife Annie and their four children. Very little evidence of his house and shop remains, although there are still Victorian features on some of the buildings alongside historic Cowgate, Culpin's premises were part of a retail storefront row that was rebuilt in 1983. Take a look at the images of Cowgate. They date from a few years after Henry Culpin had died. However, this is what the area would have looked like when he was still walking the earth. Was this the scene that greeted Henry every morning when he arrived at his tailor's shop? In 1912, Henry Culpin's premises became the Peterborough City Garage Company, as seen here. This is the only photo of Henry Culpin's premises, as close to what it would have looked like when he was resident. If you'd like to find out more about Henry James Culpin, Master Taylor, check out the links in the video description. What are the chances? Here's another button. And this one... I think it, it has got a maker's name on. Brilliant. Right. Deptford. Brilliant. William Wright, master tailor and gentleman's outfitter, lived and worked at 76 to 78 Deptford High Street. This is what the area looks like today. And this is what it looked like when William Wright was living there. William Walter Wright was the first of four generations of Master Taylor. Cecil Walter Wright was the last. Here he is. To read more about William Wright of Deptford, check out the links in my video description. Alright guys, here it is. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. Oh god. I'm going to grab it. There. little cloth seal there. spotted something sticking up out of the mud and I don't quite recognize it but it might be something so let's have a look um, <laughs> here it is now that's interesting very worm like around the rim here it looks like it could just be the lid of something but it's heavy so I'm going to clean that up and then we'll have another look. Nice brass item, I think. Okay, well here it is, cleaned up slightly. 
and it looks like it might have been some sort of dial that hooked on to something but here all around here is rubber there's a rubber insert so maybe it had glass in there or something I'm gonna check that out and the information will be up on the screen in just a minute but I'm really pleased with that find it's an interesting mystery find Alright, so thanks to my um, brilliant followers on Instagram and TikTok, I do know what this is. I've cleaned it up. It is actually a tax disc holder. I thought it was maybe a reflector or a rear view mirror, something like that. I at first thought it was a dial, but then I realized that nothing attached to what would have been the face of the dial. So obviously, no, it's a standalone item its function you know you can see there it clipped onto something half of the clip is missing it is a cowie 1930s tax disc and this would have gone on the window on the frame of the window of a touring or tourer car so uh yeah i'm pleased with that i got this really cleaned up and actually it now serves a different purpose it stands up as a frame so um i'm either going to paint something in there or use it as a photo frame, but I'm really pleased with that. I'm glad I took it home. Guys, I haven't had one of these for an absolute age. There you go, can you see the end, the head of that nail there? I've got a number of nails like this at home with letters on the head. I'll put those on the screen now. They're a bit of a mystery. I've done quite a lot of research into these, but they have uh, evaded discovery. All right, info on the screen now. Okay, here it is. backstory to this. I saw this poking up out of the ground, this little bit here. I went to get my camera to film it. Couldn't find it when I came back and lovely Giovanni and Tommy who were down there just came and searched all this area with me to find it. They couldn't see it, I couldn't see it. They went just now it's popped up out of the ground so there we go. Nice bit. Fairly modern. Look at that G or is it an A? It's an A. What's a G? It's an A. Lovely. So it might be about time for me to do the old history of the doves type with you. I'm sure lots of you know it anyway. I normally don't go near it because it's been done to death, but go on, I'll put my spin on it. Here we are, the doves type story. Okay, so Dove's type story. Let's do a deepish dive. Dove's type is legendary as it has a dramatic story attached to it. And here it is. Our story starts when master punch cutter Edward Price was commissioned to create a typeface based on Nicholas Jensen's 15th century Venetian type. Although the father of the Kelmscott Press, William Morris, had already created his own type in this style called the Golden Type, Dove's which came along years later, was declared more faithful to the original Venetian letter forms, thus making it the go-to type based on 15th century Venetian type. Now Price's punch cut type was commissioned by Dove's Press of Hammersmith, a celebrated publishing house led by business partners Thomas James Cobden Sanderson and Emery Walker. Prince's type, produced only in 16 point, was used in all of the press's publications, including some of Milton's work and their edition of the King James Bible. Interestingly, Doves wanted the type to do the talking. Therefore, the books were stripped of any frippery and fancy, and, as Robert Green, producer of the modern-day facsimile version of the type, says, the elegantly clear and legible type acted alone as visual siren song. So far, so good. Yet, it's all about to go wrong. 
By 1909, Walker and Cobden Sanderson were at the pinnacle of a bitter, protracted dispute involving both the rights to the Dove's type and how exactly they were going to go about the dissolution of the partnership. The fallout started in 1906. Walker's interest in the press has dwindled, while Cobden Sanderson's had grown to obsessive heights. Walker, who had a number of other interests, effectively left the business in 1906. At the same time, subscribers to Dove's press publications dropped off and the business was running at a loss. Despite the business partner's vow that the typeface would be shared should they ever part ways, the arrangement was not honoured. Cobden Sanderson didn't want to see it through. The thought of doves being used by another press, worse still by a mechanical press, absolutely horrified him. He despised mechanical industry and he wrote in his diary that he would guarantee the type would never be used in a press pulled otherwise than by the hand and arm of man. Despite money troubles, Cobden Sanderson wanted to continue Dove's press alone, which meant one of two things, successfully retaining the sole use of Dove's type or getting rid of the whole thing, making sure that no one else could use it ever again. And that's just what he did. Between August 1916 and January 1917, Cobden Sanderson dropped more than a ton of cast metal print type from the west side of Hammersmith Bridge. He made around 170 trips in the London gloaming, from his Dove's Press workshop all the way to the bridge, sending hundreds of pieces of Dove's type tumbling into the River Thames each time he visited. Cobden Sanderson, described by an ex-employee, as having an ego that was almost pathological, jettisoned the entire set of type into the Thames. And even when he died in 1922, he was absolute in his actions, unrepentant to the last. But wait, there's more to this story. In 2015, a designer named Robert Green created a facsimile of the Dove's type using original pieces of type salvaged from the River Thames. Robert, assisted by the Port of London Authority, had divers recover a number of pieces from the Thames, 150 in total. The type was digitally recreated and is now distributed by type spec. So if you enjoyed that story, please take a look at the links in the video description to do an even deeper dive into the dramatic details. Right, a second ago you would have heard me yelping for joy because here we go, the jackpot is here. Look at this trade bead, it is the best one I have ever found. All right, so where we are was a massive area of trade in the, well, from the 16th, century onwards actually but I'd say around the 18th century this trade bead probably got here from far away either going out from us across the waters uh, as part of the transatlantic slave trade or coming back to us probably dropped by a trader look at that beauty though i mean it's a dodgy thing isn't it because this is so beautiful but what has it seen it's a silent witness of the past one thing to bear in mind with trade beads is that while they were used in the transatlantic slave trade not every bead was used to trade for what was termed as human cargo and that is enslaved peoples they were also used to trade for gold, ivory, other commodities, and they were used to trade safe passage across the open seas as well. This bead here was most likely made in Venice, and it would have been for use in West Africa. Here's a nice one. Let's see if it's intact. It certainly is. What a pretty pipe bowl. I will get that washed off and we'll find out some more about it.
spotted something marvellous. Here it is. It's a piece of medieval pottery. Oh, look at that, it's lovely. And this is part of a jug handle. You can see here the stabbing uh, pieces and the slashing pieces there. Pieces, what am I on? Anyway, you can see the stabbing and the slash marks. And they are both to help grip the jug handle and they are also a decorative element. So this is a white ware and I will put some comparisons up on the screen for you. But beautiful, the green splashed glaze, love it. Now I've been after one of these for a very long time. And this is one of those with a twist. So I'm talking about a tile with a paw print from a cat or a dog in. Now this, I think, is actually finger prints of whoever made this tile. So I'm going to get that home and look at it more closely. But if I can see in there some signs of fingertips, um, that would be pretty cool. A coin or a fried bit of metal. Oh, it's knackered. I think it probably was a coin though. That is a coin. Okay, let's see. I mean, is it a love token? It could be. Let's see how, <laughs> how well I can clean this up. It's, uh, oh, goodness me. You can make out a bit of the coin just there. Looks like a corner of a shield. I'm going to have to really be careful with this. All right. Well then, guys, how did I do with the cleaning? Not bad, eh? Well enough, in fact, for my Mudlark pal Cuffs to tell me that this coin is actually a Henry VIII groat from the Canterbury Mint. Now, these coins were issued posthumously under the reign of Edward VI from 1547 to 51. I don't need to tell you that I found much earlier coins than this one. But because it's the Tudors, because it's Henry VIII, people went wild for this coin and I am so here for it. Cuffs, who gave me the ID, reminded me of Henry's nickname, Old Coppernose. He also told me how that nickname came about. Look carefully at the silver coin. Can you see the little green spot on it and the coppery colour slightly highlighted in some areas? This is because of coin debasement. By the end of his reign, to fund wars and save money, Henry was debasing these apparently silver coins with copper. So much so, in fact, that when they wore down, the copper would shine through. Where was the first place they'd wear down? Henry's nose, of course. And that's how Henry VIII got the nickname Old Copper Nose. Because I just spotted something beautiful really beautiful okay you know what it is it's here wow it's a piece of delftware tile but it's absolutely stunning look how detailed that is and there's a man i think he's in a dutch hat um i think working away there um and there's someone else just behind him but this Blimey, heavens to Betsy, I absolutely love it. It's gorgeous. All right, let's see what I can find out about that. Now I've got to say all thanks to Mark Soden for the identification of this one. He's got the Book of Legends um, and that is Tin Glazed Tiles from London, which I am still needing to get a copy of. So thanks Mark for the ID. That is a winner. Really beautiful decorative element. And you can see here where that's been hand finished. And it's just got this lovely floral, not quite a fleur de lis, but oh, love it. Well, there you go, guys. That's it. Some of my favorite finds from 2022. I hope you enjoyed that. We've got loads of great stuff coming up and I'll be back down on the foreshore very soon. See you then.